The head of the Schuylkill Regatta is a tradition of exceptional fall racing that began five decades ago. The year was 1970. For college graduates, there was no rowing competition offered on the Schuylkill River. We realized that as soon as you graduated, you really had no place to compete. That's when we came up with the head of the Schuylkill. The newly established head of the Schuylkill Regatta emphasized graduate oarsmen and opened racing to newly emerging masters and women's teams. The fact that they invited us in, it really meant a lot to us. The head of the Schuylkill Regatta now boasts more than 9,000 competitors, with 150 events including para and adaptive, alumni, parent-child, and corporate events. It's a big race, a lot of entrants, a lot of good competition. You get a chance to race people from all over the region and all over the United States and sometimes from other places in the world. Because of Boathouse Row and all the big names on that row, getting to row on this water and this beautiful river is a pretty nice opportunity. For over 30 years, the success of the regatta was attributed to two dedicated directors who worked tirelessly, not only in planning the scope of the regatta, but executing in the trenches. Just a beautiful race. People do a great job putting it on. It's just a special event. So many teams on and off the water working to accomplish something positive. The head of the Schuylkill Regatta retains this work ethic as its 300 plus volunteers deliver a world-class event with local flair. Our volunteers are the roots and the future of the regatta. It is often said that there is a draw to the Schuylkill River that is unlike any other. The history, the vista, the fellowship, the challenge. A former Olympian called the head of the Schuylkill Regatta a racer's race, with serious competition on a no-nonsense, challenging course. I think it's one of the better head races in the fall. I think it's more of a test of speed. Our original mission to provide a fair, safe, and competitive regatta for all who want to row is more important now than ever. We showcase Philadelphia and the Schuylkill River not only as the birthplace of American rowing, but in its continued role as one of the most significant rowing venues in the country. We continue to immortalize the stories of the Schuylkill legends and grow the opportunities for legends in the making. We invite you to build your own story and to be part of the tradition of the best head race in the world. Good evening. My name is Jen Wesson, and on half, behalf of the head of the Schuylkill Regatta Board of Directors, I welcome you to night two of our 50th anniversary celebration. We are thrilled to have you join us for a programming that is near and dear to my heart, 50 Years, 50 Stories. First, I'd like to give a huge thanks to Five Tribes Cinema Productions and Colin Stewart, graduate of Drexel University and now an alumni of the Drexel rowing team for their energy and thoughtfulness as they put into our 50th anniversary video. While 2020 has presented challenges for everyone, it has also uncovered opportunities, like the ability to gather on a subject like this tonight. The HOSR has a history of honoring legends of the Schuylkill by naming races in their honor, by documenting stories, passing them down through generations, and being inclusive of not just those pictures that hang on the walls that are important to both our past and the future of our sport. So to celebrate HOR's, HOSR's 50th anniversary, we wanted to highlight 50 legendary stories of competitors, crews, teams, coaches, um, and volunteers over the 50 years of the regatta. We put together a committee, um, which is very much the inspiration for tonight. The committee decided that this list could never be exhaustive, but should be representative of the breadth of competition that this regatta allows for. And most importantly, the culture of the HOSR and the rowing community. And there are gonna be likely, there'll likely be some well-known names and crews, but our goal is to also show those lesser known crews. This list could include volunteers, influencers, and persons who have really catapulted the regatta into a fall classic. We will reveal, reveal one story a week over the next year, um, pushing it out through social media, and it'll live on our webpage. 
um, and it will continue the celebration all the way through to the 2021 regatta. So let me take a minute to introduce the Committee 50. Honestly, they need no introduction. They're all rock stars. Rick Stalick is the first. Rick began rowing in 1962 for Howerton High School. He became a full-time scholar in 1966 and joined the Malta Boat Club. He has since continued to compete for them on both an elite and master's level. And he served as their coach, the president, and actively supports their operations and maintenance of the club. Recently, he's been involved in the preservation of historic archives for the club and Boathouse Row, and he's shown me some pretty cool things. Jim Dietz. Jim is one of our true sports true legends. He started rowing on Long Island Sound at the age of 16 and quickly rose into, into a national standout and rowed in his first Olympics in the summer of 1972. Since then, Jim has been to six Olympics as a rower or a coach and numerous world championships and has competed all around the world. He started his coaching career at the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy and moved to and moved on to the U.S. Coast Guard Academy and then to U UMass Amherst. And don't let his rock star status fool you. He also has stories about being a stake boat holder on a raft. Christopher Blackwall. Christopher began rowing as a boy at Radley College and all boys secondary school in England. He attended Oxford where he rowed six seat in the winning 1967 Oxford Varsity Eight against Cambridge. He went on to uh, row for the British national team. And in 1979, he took the position, new position as executive director, director of the National Association of Amateur Oarsmen, also known today as U.S. Rowing. Um, Christopher also, uh, during that time, joined University Barge Club in Philadelphia, was the head of the Schuylkill Regattas, regatta director for over 30 years. He founded Philadelphia Adaptive Rowing in 1980 with the help of Dolly Driscoll and Isabel Bone and is the co-founder of Access to Rowing and Paddling, not to mention 2019 U.S. Rowing Medal of Honor recipient. Dottie Brown started rowing in the late 1990s because she was jealous of, of, her, um, of all the fun that her neighbor, Ellen Carver, was having on the river. After leaving a long career as a reporter and editor at the Philadelphia Inquirer, and as a member of the Vesper Boat Club, she was asked by Temple University Press to write a history of Boathouse Row. Her book, Boathouse Row, Waves of Change in the Birthplace of America, makes clear why this iconic 19th century venue is so important to Philadelphia and the nation's history of rowing. Alan Robinson. Alan's a member of HOSR Board of Directors, raced in his first, first HOSR as a Penn senior, and he's a member of University Barge Club and more recently, Cape Cod Rowing Incorporated. He, together with the Schuylkill Navy and the HOSR, were the recipient in 2018 of the World Rowing Federation's first annual sustainability award. Pete Simone, he is a member and a past president of Vesper Boat Club. He is a member of the Philadelphia Wall of Champions Committee, which you'll hear more about tomorrow night in our virtual broadcast. And Ellen Carver, she started rowing in 1998 because she wanted to be healthy, never expecting to fall in love with the rowing, with rowing and its people. She stayed on HOSR was her first regatta, and she is now president of the board of directors and a member of University Barge Club. So this committee was an inspiration, as I said, for this evening. We, um, we started meeting on Fridays. It was a regular thing, and um, the, the committee's subject matter expanded into stories, and the banter was back and forth, was just something that is not to be missed. Um, so we wanted to turn this really into an opportunity and something we've long wanted to do um, to share stories. So we ask you tonight to interact. Use the chat room features, um, whether you're tuning in through Facebook or through YouTube, you can use the, the uh, chat room feature and we will uh, highlight your comments, um, deliver your questions to the presenters and just sit back and enjoy. So I'm going to turn it over to Dottie to introduce the first story of our 50 of the 50 in our series, and then Pete Simone is going to facilitate the storytelling by everyone after that. So again, encourage you to use the chat feature and sit back and have some fun. Thank you. So hi everyone. Um, I just want to say that 
if you have watched the head of the Schuylkill Regatta and seen all the women involved in the uh, among the 8,000 participants in recent years, at least half have been women, um, but you'd never think that women won the right to vote before they won the right to row. Um, Pierre de Coubertin had this to say in 1896 when he started the modern day Olympics. Women have but one task, that of crowning the winner with garlands. It is indecent that the spectator should be exposed to the risk of seeing the body of a woman being smashed before their very eyes. So in the old days, women did not row. Um, the Victorians just thought it was far too difficult a sport and, and too unseemly for what was always called a manly sport. But in 1938, the Philadelphia Girls Rowing Club was formed, and it was the first competitive women's rowing club in the United States. Uh, they had no one to compete against for many years. They basically raced each other. That began to change in the 1960s, which is when Karen Constant, who's the person I will be talking about tonight, came on the scene. Her story is the first of many biographies that the head of the Schuylkill Regatta is assembling for its 50th anniversary. So let me read you a little bit of Karen's story. Karen Constant remembers the day in August 1969 that she was lured into rowing. I ran one of these eight and a half mile loops on the Schuylkill. And after I fin finished, here comes this little guy saying, would you like to row? I'd always been interested in Germany. I would always watch the regattas, but the men would not allow women to row at that time. So I just watched the races. I loved the boats and the way they felt. They were all wood in those days. So when he asked me if I wanted to row, I said, sure. And he said, when would you like to start? And I said, I'll start tomorrow. Gus Constant, a rower and coach at the Vesper Boat Club with the encouragement of John B. Kelly Jr. had just started recruiting women. Jinx Becker was the first and Karen was second. Women's competition was heating up. The Vesper Boat Club, um, their eight had just won an extraordinary and unexpected gold medal in the 1964 Olympics. And they wanted to be in the vanguard when women's rowing finally hit its stride. Karen told me, Gus and I would sit on Vesper's porch watching the runners go by. There's a woman with good legs, let's ask her. And by good legs, did not mean beautiful legs in those days or even long legs. They were looking for muscular legs for the leg drive. Karen herself, only five foot four, qualified. We'd go down to recreation centers and check out the basketball players and we'd check out swimmers. And if we thought there was somebody that was a good athlete, we would recruit them. So we came in with the first team. Karen said, they rode in the head of the Charles in 1971, one of the first women crews to do so. And Karen went on to national victories. While her marriage to Gus did not last long, her love affair with rowing continues to this day. By her count, she has competed in at least 32 years of the head of the Schuylkill's half century, often in multiple events. In 1975, the first year women rowed in the head of the Schuylkill, she won a bronze in the single and a gold in the eighth. All told, she's won 30 first place, uh, first place medals at the regatta and has eight of the original silver Thomas Aikens first place medals. She puts her many rowing awards way up high in my exercise room so I don't have to dust them. I don't know if you guys have the photo of Karen with her medals, but it's somewhere. Anyway, Karen, I'd like to introduce you right now. Uh, Karen Constant, tell us some of what it was like to be a woman early on, on the Schuylkill River. Okay, I'm on. Karen, go ahead. Okay, am I on? We can hear you. Okay, good. Um, well, those early days uh, at Vespa were very hard. Uh, the men didn't want us there. It was okay as long as it was just Jinx and me, but then when we got up to 10 rowers, they started pushing back. Uh, it was the men's team led by Mike Crispoli, who was the ringleader. Every time there was a meeting at Vesper, he wanted the women voted out. And Jack Kelly said, no, finally, the women will stay. They're here to stay. So then that was the end of that story. Uh, however, during that time, we had a little locker room down at the first floor. 
And one day we come in and they had put two by fours all across the door. The next time uh, we were getting ready to row, we're in the eight and the men are standing up on the, on the uh, top there. And they had a gun and they pointed the gun at us and says, we're going to shoot you. And so this went on and on and on. And uh, then finally, as Foley left and things quieted down. Uh, let's see. Our training in those early days was all done in singles. And we had one pair, a Vespa pair. So we had uh, two girls from Sweden. And when they left, the Johnics came over. And then the Johnics rode in the pair. And everybody else trained in singles and maybe a couple doubles. So we never really got out in the eight. And the first time there was an eight race in Philadelphia at one of the regattas, we said, oh, an eight race for women. Let's row it. So we got in the day before, had one practice and raced in an eight. And this sort of find I find amazing because now when I recruit women for my master's international team, oh, I'm only a scholar. I'm only a sweeper. We didn't know the difference. It was both rowing. And that's, I still look at it, you row. It doesn't matter whether you sweep or you, you skull. It's all rowing. And, but, and, but now they all specialize. In those days, we were lucky if we had a race. There were very few races for women. We were raced against Radcliffe. We would go up to Radcliffe. They would come down to Philadelphia. We went down to George Washington University. They would come and race us. And then slowly, slowly, women, women's events were added to the Philadelphia Regattas. And then finally, at the head of the school kill. Now, in those days, there was an eight and a single. I think that's all they had. No masters or anything. So we ended the single in, uh, in the eight. And uh, I was standing there at one regatta, and it was amazing. The entries had just snowballed. It was so nice to see all these crews coming down. And I was standing next to Coleman Boylan, who had never wrote, but he kept running things and organizing things. And I said to Coleman, isn't this nice to have all these competitors? He says, no, we're going to limit the entries next year. I was shocked. But that was the attitude. Um, so oh, that, that brings me up to the other point. In those days, the turkey trot in Philadelphia was open only to men. So Gus one day said, this year we're going to enter women. So he entered four of us. He only used the initials, not the first names. So the four of us got to the starting line and Coleman Boyle, the same guy that wanted limits to the head of the school guild, came running out and started to rip our numbers off. And then he said, all right, the race won't go off if the girls don't leave the starting line. And Gus said, that's okay, then you won't have a race. <laughs> so that's- Things have changed, haven't they, Karen? They've changed a lot. It changed a lot, but the women that are rowing now don't realize how good they have it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. They have the trouble that we went through to fight just to even get into a boat and go out for a pra practice. All right. That's why the women is the, the history is so important, and and women yeah. should learn about it. And then people, oh, Karen, she's nasty. She always whatever. Those days made me that way. I had to continuously fight for the women, and. I'm looking at some of the men on this program and I remember fighting them, you know, so I'm just laughing. Thanks so much, Karen. Yeah. That's a great story. Do you have time for my Masters International? I don't know. So Karen runs a Masters International program that's great and you'll have to read about it online. Okay. We've run out of time. Awesome. Thank you, Karen. It was so good to have you on tonight. Pete's going to join Dottie. And there he is. And Hi, everybody. Hi. And um, please be feel free to get your beverage of choice. This is a happy hour. What a great concept. Happy hour on Monday night, uh, uh, Jen and Ellen. And, and I got to Vesper about 10 years after Karen did. And uh, what she said was true. It was a tough, tough time for women to break into rowing. But she was a pioneer. And... Uh, she uh, helped a lot of the men slowly and painfully evolve uh, into the sensitive new age guys we are today. Um, Jen mentioned Jim Dietz is, is on our panel tonight. And 
if anybody was a rock star, it was Jim. Uh, he was, when he went to Europe in the 70s, the Europeans all knew who he was. He would sign autographs and he's always been a great champion and uh, very gracious. Uh, so Jim was gonna maybe tell us, you know, even, even though the head of school is 50 years old, uh, American head racing started in Boston really uh, with the head of the Charles and Jim was there, right Jim? I was there for the very first. Uh, the Charles started in 1965 and it was the brainchild of Darcy McMahon, Howard McIntyre, and an Englishman named Ernie Arlette. And just like the Schuylkill, the clubs on the Charles that, that were in college rowing programs were looking for something for their members. And they talked to Ernie Arlette, who grew up uh, Henley on Thames, England. And he told them about this racing that they do in Great Britain uh, called head racing. Chris Blackwell, I'm sure, grew up with it. But that was the first brainchild to... to start people off and five years later the second big brainchild for you know the same reason that that came about in your introductory piece this after, this evening took the the head of the school kill off and, it, and it's amazing how these regattas and technology have grown over the years uh i, I i'm not sure about what the the first timing system was at the head of the Schuylkill, but the head of the Charles, you rode by the BU boathouse and there was a Seth Thomas clock on a three quarter inch piece of plywood. And they took your picture with the state of the art camera of the time called a Polaroid. And then as you cross the finish line, there was another Seth Thomas clock set supposedly to the same second hand sweep. And another photo was taken and they went into the Cambridge Boat Club and somebody took the two photos and did the math. That's how winners and losers were determined. Right. And, and that's why it took so long to get results out and why they had to have kegs of beer at the regattas just to keep people occupied while they were waiting. Yeah, absolutely, Jim. I think the head of the school, I think we use carrier pigeons because I can remember <laughs> the results that were contested for days, I think. But um, now you won a lot ahead of the Schuylkill races, probably more than you remember. I think you told me maybe 15 or so. Is that right? Oh, I don't. I have no idea. Yeah. And no since idea. there are no results, you can claim as many as you want because nobody can check. I mean, I won about 20 myself, but you uh -huh. won 25 or 30. But anyway, you didn't win all the time. And you told me of an instance in 1970. Um, you had you had great doubles partners. Not only rode the single, but you rode with uh, Bill Belden, who Correct. Uh, was a great champ. And uh, even though, you know, you're our token Philadelphian tonight or non-Philadelphian, <laughs> you're not a Philadelphian, but you're not, you spent a lot of time on the Schuylkill River. And I know you raced with your good friend, uh, Larry Klataski in a, in a, in a pretty uh, rough race in the seventies, right? It was a, it was an incredible race. It, it, it was a typical windy white cap Schuylkill on that third week of October and Larry and I, the previous week, had won the head of the Charles in the, in the championship double. And we're approaching the Angels statues, moving towards Girard Avenue Bridge. And two club scholars, two great guys, John Bann and John Tierney, they start to move up on us. And I'm pulling as hard as I can. I'm just going for it. Bannon and Tierney just keep coming, and I'm thinking to myself, is this the end of Klikatsky and Dietz? How could Bannon and Tierney be coming on us? And I go, Larry, come on, we got to go now. And Larry just says, give it up. And I turn around. Larry is sunk up to his waist in the Schuylkill River. The bow deck on the old Stemfley wooden boat opened up, and we went right to the bottom, right? And that's well, the race I remember. It's not it just I won. That's the race I remember. It just shows that you guys were so good. The only way we could be, people could beat you was to sink you. So yeah. I, I hope Bannon and Tierney, Bannon and Tierney are listening tonight. I hope they are too. Hi, yeah. John. <laughs> um, I don't know if we have Fred yet uh, or or Rick. Is is Rick there or Dan? I guess next. Um, it looks like uh, we're going to go to Alan next. And Alan. Then, um, you know, I've known for many years 
professionally. And I know he, he went to Penn uh, back in the day, wrote at Penn, and then sort of took a break from rowing for a while, was a was a, a race walker. And then, Alan, I think you came back to the sport maybe 15 years ago. Is that right? Or more? I took, thir- I took a 36-year uh, hiatus and came right. back 15 years ago. All right. And um, a- Alan, in addition to being a, a, a really good master's rower, uh, is is passionate about the environment, and as um, as uh, Jen mentioned earlier, because of his efforts, uh, he uh, received an, uh, the first ever international stewardship award from FISA, which is I think quite an accomplishment. So, Alan, do you want to tell us about what you've been doing with stewardship at the head of the school and other regattas? I will, but before I get, get into the into the the story, there are six people in particular. I want to acknowledge because none of this is done alone. It's everything's done as a team with individuals and then with the much larger group and community. Those six people are Margaret Briggs and Bonnie Mueller of the Schuylkill Navy leadership. Mm-hmm. Ellen and Jen from the head of the Schuylkill. And at the very start, my real teammates in this effort, in the start of this effort, you need teammates to get started, were, were Dear Jim Mullen, and Tom Barron, and I hope they're on the call tonight because uh, without them, I don't think this would have gotten rolling. Um, what happened was I was a member of the uh, the the famous or the infamous dredging uh, committee of the Schuylkill Navy, and it was uh, 2015, and we were uh, February 2015. We had just learned that there was no chance of federal funding for the dredging. Mm-hmm. Biggs, who was commoner at the time, uh, said during our meeting, you know. We've really got to work on building up our relationship uh, with the local community, the city government, uh, the various departments within the city, and then the greater community. If we're going to find a way to fund the dredging, uh, we need to, you know, we, we need to reach out. And uh, I guess it was she who suggested we form a uh, subcommittee, and we came up with the name of the Schuylkill Navy River Stewards Committee, mm-hmm. and I volunteered to lead it. And the first things we did is one, we invited members of uh, uh, leaders of the Philadelphia Water Department to join our next meeting in March. And we decided to have a riverbank cleanup on the west side underneath the Girard Avenue Bridge, as well as along uh, Kelly Drive. For the Kelly Drive, we recruited uh, uh, several of the high schools, including a Philadelphia City Rowing. And we got about 30 volunteers, uh, masters, rowers, volunteers for the west side. Some of them, I think, are on on, the call, uh, on this call tonight. Mike and Gabby uh, Chipolone were part of it, Deirdre was part of it, uh, and others. And uh, we cleaned up on that April day something on the order of 4,600 plastic bottles and over 1,000 pounds of litter just from that bank from Gerard down to the dam. Yeah. And we felt very accomplished until a day or two later I realized, you know, we come back to your year from now, all that there'll be a whole another set of litter coming back because we see it when we row. We know mm-hmm. we know it's there. And that's when the light bulb came on and said, we've got to do something to stop that litter from getting into the river. And it just so happened that two weeks later, I was invited to lunch by Ellen Carver and Mitch Budman. And they told me that the, the board of the head of the school call had invited me to become a member of the board. I was I was honored, and I said, of course I would accept. And then they asked me, what what would I like to do as a you know to lead as a, a member of the board? And what I said, what I like to do is stop single use water bottles from being used at our regattas. And between the riverbank cleanup and the litter, and the water initiative that we started, uh, we got something rolling. We partnered with the Philadelphia Water Department. Uh, you'll recall the uh, the first of the water monsters. The, we had 10, 125 gallon water monsters to provide water. We the city provided us with 12,000 refillable water bottles, and uh, we started something. We started both at the head of the Schuylkill and at Stotesbury. Right, and Alan, you told me that you've done surveys, and roughly 80 percent of the people were not using single use water bottles, which is a huge metric. Well, right? well, we found that last year's we got it on. On Sunday, the high school day, we surveyed uh, the chuck wagons along the river, and we found that something on the order of 78% of them were bringing their water in containers of a gallon or larger, you know, the large mm-hmm. gallon uh, Gatorade type uh, containers. 
Uh, so it's a huge change from where we were five years ago. The second right. thing we do is we survey, we started surveying the park when we were done. Because when I first got involved, the park, after when we left it, when the regatta left it, it was just a mess. It was just covered with litter. And we realized that's what we wanted to stop. And we evolved our initiative into a zero litter initiative. Uh, three years ago, we achieved that at the end of the regatta, both days on, uh, at Stokes Ferry and head of the Schuylkill. But then we said, let's make it in real time. And we really, in the last, the last two years of the regattas, we've achieved that. Zero litter during the course of the event. Right. And and it, would, it just showed me what a community can do together to change, to make a change, a positive change. And I, and I think, as you alluded to, beyond the environmental impacts, the reason this is so important is, as you said, you've built partnerships with different agencies in the city of Philadelphia, which I know helped tremendously move the dredging initiative forward. So, you know, sometimes those little steps lead to big projects like like, like the dredging. So it, it, it did. And, you know, the, th the other things we did with the stewardship committee is we addressed the invasive vines on the, you know, growing up and killing the trees along the river. Right. Bank, uh, the invasive, the invasive, uh, invasive trees, um, the weeds and trees that were growing out of the east wall. Um, and we did that together with departments of the city. And it really gave us, it gave us traction. It gave us credibility. And, it, it, it did provide that support we needed when we needed the city to take the leadership for getting the money for the dredging. Which okay. And I'm going to suggest a new one for you next year. Whoever collects the most dead spotted lantern fly should get a special prize. <laughs> I'm going to look for you to do that uh, in, the, in the next regatta. And, and I'm going to go over to Chris Blackwell now. I mean, as Jen mentioned, Chris was director of the regatta for three decades. Um, if, if you don't know who Chris is and you're in Philadelphia, you've been living in a cave because he is Mr. Rowling in the city of Philly. He's done so much. And one of the things he's been very involved with and passionate about is his work with adaptive rowing. Right, Chris? Yes, uh, absolutely true. And I want to deal first with the, the two things. Um, you never know. And then, of course, there's uh, written courage I want to talk about. The You Never Know pieces, but yes, I was co-founder of the first adaptive rowing, properly organized, incorporated adaptive rowing company, uh, uh, entity in the United States and possibly the world. I'm not sure about the world part, but anyway, we were, we were, we were early. And the other half of the we was a, a guy named Jim McGowan, who was an African-American paraplegic. And he called me one day. I was sitting in my office at Bodas Row, the NAAO slash US rowing. And he said, do you think that someone like me, a paraplegic, could row? And I said, well, yeah, I do know that because I, know, I knew of a couple of boats that would work, one being the Alden Ocean Shell and the other being a boat called the Rowcat, which you don't see anywhere anymore mm -hmm. uh, because they're huge and unwieldy. But I had, um, so... Uh, you just don't know how things are going to go. But all I did, all I did really was, was to get the thing in motion and then the athletes themselves took it to new levels. Athletes like Dolly Driscoll in a wheelchair born, mm -hmm. uh, Isabel Bone, single leg, single leg amputee. Isabel in particular basically went at one, at one point to Germany where she grew up and said to FITA, you will put you will put adaptive rowing in the world championships. And they said, okay, because they didn't dare defy her. She was an awesome force of nature. So other people took my the seed that I sowed and grew it into what now is incredible, not only in the, in the world championships, but the Par Paralympic Games. Chris, do you know how big the adaptive program in Philadelphia is today? Do you have any idea? I think his screen froze. No, well, we just Chris froze. <laughs> so, uh, hopefully, we will. He will defrost him, <laughs> and um, maybe what we'll do is we'll come back to Chris, uh, and may maybe what we'll do is go to Alex Cook. Um, 
Uh, Alex, uh, I, I'm sure many of you know, he's a, 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 a great guy. He first wrote a pen in 1974. And Alex is the type of guy who makes an indelible impression with everyone he comes in contact with. Usually it's good. Uh, <laughs> but he's been a, a really important soldier in the Army of head of the Schuylkill Volunteers. And, and, and I like to call him the Secretary of State for the head of the Schuylkill because what he does is he works with all the international crews coming to town and helps them find boats and, and sometimes coxswains, right, Alex? That's exactly right. Well, well put. Would you like me well, to continue? I would. I'd like you to tell us about what you do and and maybe some of the uh, some of the things that have happened. Sure, I'd, I'd be honored. I'll keep it short too, and I'll try not to freeze. <laughs> um, yeah. So. Uh, yeah, first I wrote in the head of the school was 1974, and I remember there was a, a giant among giants, a guy named Jim Dietz, going down there in the single, kicking everybody. But um, and uh, but you know, since then I've really become to realize that this is such a um, um, a, a volunteers community uh, event, and uh, it's, it's been uh, it's been um, uh, somehow I got wrangled into. Um, organizing boats for international crews coming in and, and help, helping them find coxswains and, and uh, other rowers. But um, it it's amazes me. I mean, the head of the Schuylkill has got folks from Australia and Ireland and Israel and a really group, great group of folks, um, Eng England, Italy, China, Japan, Germany. Uh, and I'm sure Ellen or somebody would know some more of the countries they're coming from. Um, one um, one funny story, um, that, and then I'll I'll, I'll close up. Was um, it, part of organizing all these boats. Uh, th there's a great uh, involvement with uh, all the, the the clubs on Boathouse Row, loaning boats, loaning coxswains, the universities. A lot of the high schools do. Uh, but there was one. Um, I was down to the the end, and it's always a scramble trying to get everybody filled and and boats. Mm -hmm. We had two four withs that um, that I, I needed coxswains for at the end, um, and I had uh, a coxswain for um, the the faster boat, which was looked like an international boat. And the the, the coxswain said, "Oh, I'd, I'd be happy to jump in there and take care of that." And um, all of a sudden, they found another coxswain to to race that fast boat. And I said, "Hey, listen, I just had this other boat. I think they're from West Virginia. They really need a cox bad." And she said, um, "Oh, I'm I'm uh, I'm uh, I'm kind of busy." Be and I explained to her that there was kind of a short, fat guy and a tall, kind of lanky guy in the boat, and she just was not interested in, in being a part of that that um, four with. So I called Kathleen Neiman, who is unbelievable. She had coxed probably six races and rode in four or five of them, and she jumped in there, and those guys won that four with race hands down and uh it was what what a great ending for for that regatta but did you, did you see the coxswain who turned down the assignment or uh, after that no i i didn't say a thing I hope okay. I didn't, I didn't hope. <laughs> so you know uh, plot hunting is a is a well-worn art form at uh at uh at the head of the schuylkill uh the commodore of the schuylkill navy i think his name's paul horvat he's really at putting together boats and week events with people who are all better rowers than he is. So it's, it's a, it's a very valued tradition on the Schuylkill. Um, yeah. One question for you, Alex, who, what country, who are the folks that are the most fun? I mean, in your experience with dealing with the international crews. Well, um, I, th you know, the, I'm sure they all have their fun sides. The, the most fun were the, uh, the Irish eight and uh, everybody from, from the land of Oz is, is, uh, is a hoot. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure who that is, but we can we can get into that later. Thank you. Um, now we're going to go to Rick, Rick Stelic. Um, I think most people know Rick. He was a, a bronze medalist in the lightweight double in 1977. He's uh, been a long, lifelong member, as far as I know, of Malta. And you know the stories we're telling tonight. It's part of the culture of Boathouse Row and Philadelphia rowing. It's something that. Um, I think we all value to be able to tell these stories or to look back and see what happened in the clubs, you know, 50, 60 years ago. That's something that 
maybe being lost a little bit. And Rick has been um, working on that with with uh, sort of a, a a project that he's very passionate about, right, Rick? No, Rick. Yeah, can uh, everybody uh, hear me? Yes. All right. Okay, because I'm having a little bit of trouble hearing you, but I'll do my best. Yeah, I, I'm at Stalock, and I'm a, uh, now in my 60th year of uh, rowing, and a long time affiliated with Malta Boat Club. Um, I was actually uh, rowing in the very first head of the Schuylkill when it was called the Graduate Skulls in 1971. Um, so I've got uh, quite an appreciation of the history of it. I'm not sure if there's anybody from that regard still racing, but, um, oh, there's a hand up. That's good. Um, so um, I'm looking forward to rowing. I hope you guys are too next year when we get this thing back uh, online. But uh, what I wanted to talk about briefly was uh, at Malta, we entered into a couple of years ago a project because we had a room full of uh, records which were about to be thrown out. And uh, we undertook to try and save and preserve those. And much to our surprise, uh, we found that there were uh, the minutes for the Malta Boat Club starting in 1890 to present day. And uh, some over 4,500 pages of them after we assembled them and copied them and digitized them, along with a unbelievable Trevor Trove of, of other artifacts, uh, correspondence with the city, uh, all newspaper clippings a movie from 1927, all sorts of things. Um, we also found that there was a, many of our records were down at the Pennsylvania Historic Society for about 30 years from 1890 to 1920 that we didn't even know about, that they've been donated in 1947 by someone not even a member of the club. Um, so we got very much involved in, in archiving and checking I checked with many of the other clubs and surveyed them along Boathouse Row, and it was very interesting to find out that several clubs already had their records down at the Philadelphia uh, Seaport Museum, uh, particularly Undine, uh, Penn AC, and uh, the Schuylkill Navy, uh, and many clubs had their records up at the um, uh, Pennsylvania Historic Society, PGRC, uh, ourselves and I, the university is working on getting their records there and also number four. Um, so it's, it's, and some clubs unfortunately had lost their records and some clubs have not taken any action. But the point I wanted to make was what going through these records, it was just amazing the background stories that were there going back all those years to 1860 that are the most interesting stories you can imagine. And some of them are being relayed tonight as part of the head of the Schuylkill Regatta. One thing which was we found was that the dredging, which is in all in our minds today, is like a 20 year repeating sequence without fail. You go back to when the clubs were first founded in the 1860s and they were having dredging problems back then. And mm. every 20 years, it just reoccurred like a clockwork. So it's nothing new. Unfortunately, it gets more complicated and more expensive every year. But the other one, which was really interesting, I wanted to make a point about was the Gold Cup. I think everybody is familiar with the Gold Cup and the fact that it's been resurrected. But it's a primary example of an artifact which was lost to history for many, many years uh, because someone with the best intentions had put it aside for safety um, in his home. Unfortunately, he didn't put instructions on it and what it was. And when he passed away, uh, the family didn't realize what they had or what it was and gave it to a, apparently an antiques dealer, which was rediscovered uh, several years ago and purchased. And now is part of a wonderful resurrection of that important historic art artifact and regatta of the greatest uh, scholars in the world, the, the Gold Cup. So yeah. the point I'd like to make is to everybody out there who is listening tonight, there are people who are working on archives in Philadelphia. We're trying to expand that database so that people know where to, to go to find information. Malta is going to be putting it on its uh, website, uh, contacts. I hope other clubs will follow suit eventually. But please, please, if you have anything in your club 
or your organization, no matter how inconsequential it seems, try and save it and try and get someone in touch to try and save that data. And if you have your members who have things squirreled away, talk to them and don't let them go and end up in the dumpster. And, um, and, Rick, and Rick, my understanding is you're, you'll, you'll, uh, you can act as a resource to guide maybe some of the other club members from other, you know, instant, uh, other clubs, to what you've done and you could be a resource for them, right? Absolutely. And there's, there's some other individuals who will also be that and we'll identify those, but you know, I'm more than happy to speak with any organization or individual you know, if you have certain items you want to save or, or, or donate, we'll try and find a home for them uh, so they're properly taken care of or give you some advice on how that can be done. Uh, right. We've been through that process. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and I think it's so important because, you know, our memory is our culture. And you know, um, we're very lucky to be in a sport that's, you could, you could might say it's living history. I mean, it's been in Philadelphia for so long. And I think we're privileged to be a part of that. Uh, culture. Um, I think we're going to go over to, to, to Dottie uh, Brown, Brown for, for a minute. Dottie, uh, you're muted. Dottie. I just wanted to echo uh, Rick. Um, I spent several years digging into archives looking for the history of Boathouse Row. Um, the material that is there is fabulous, but one of the things I discovered is how, in some instances, these fabulous old books are really disintegrating. Um, one club I shall not name has them near their boiler uh, in a big plastic bin. Uh, otherwise, some of them have them in president's um, attics. Um, I had some in my hand from the late 1890s that were literally crumbling. Uh, and it's really, it's really precious. The information there is not just a history of Boathouse Throw, it's really a history of Philadelphia and its culture because a lot of the stories that come out are how we live, the, the social mores, the, the, the thefts along the river, the women who were not allowed to uh, go in and, and visit the guys in the clubs, the smoking and the money spent on whiskey. And, you know, it's on and on what our lives were like then. So I just wanted to echo the importance of the clubs taking this on in some fashion if they can. Sure. Here, can I jump in for a second? Absolutely. After, after eight years on the board of directors of U.S. Rowing, one of the initiatives that we've been trying to do, and like every organization, there isn't enough money, but this country with our history is in dire need of a museum. You know, we had a, a little footprint of one at the Mystic Seaport while Hart Perry was still alive, but uh, there are people out there that really have a ton of information. Uh, Bill Miller, uh, Tom Wheel from Yale, Tom Quinn from the New York Athletic Club. What better place to have a rowing museum than a place like Philadelphia? If they could get something up in the park, build something similar to what we have at in in England, you know, it would be a tremendous thing because we have such a rich history, you know. Yeah, Rick, I heard that Malta was going to stop rowing. We are going to put the museum in Malta. Is that true? <laughs> well, <laughs> it's too small. Oh, yeah, it is too small. You're right. What we have done, Pete, is started yeah. a, a mini library there. Okay. And we have, you know, uh, every book I have has come my way, and I recently got a whole bunch of books from Pete Mallory, who wrote The Sport of, of Rowing, who donated his collection, his resource books. Yeah. So we're trying to start a small library there. Um, and along with our minutes and any other information, which will be available to people who want to come down and look at them and, and the other information we find. So that you know, every club really, in, in essence, is a small museum. Yep, and absolutely. have one big museum. But every club, you know, as you visit them, um, is a mini museum with its own heritage. Right. And that's right. so important, you know, when you go into places like Undine and you see the history there and the architecture and the rowers on the wall, it's just yeah. fantastic. It um, is. When you, as you know, when you bring people in from the outside world and they see this stuff, their head explodes. They can't believe what history and what tradition 
And anybody who's listening tonight who hasn't read Tali's book, shame on you. When we finish tonight, I want you to get on Amazon, order several copies of the book because it'll whet your appetite for, for all the history that's, that's out there. Yeah. Um, it's funny. Uh, Thanks, Pete. Uh, Dot, Dottie mentioned, you know, about the whiskey and so forth. And yeah. going through our records from all to both, Fred Dooling famously said back in the 1920s or whatever, we were a, a smoking club with a rowing problem. Because uh, most of our budget was apparently was going to uh, to buy s cigars and uh, booze, but but that's a whole nother interesting story. I researched and found out who was supplying all that, and um, now I got I haven't got time for that tonight. But it's so there was a whole nother side story which was fascinating. We never had that problem in the seventies or eighties, and we certainly weren't smoking cigars. But that's a topic for another uh, right. session. Uh, Peter, we, Peter, last last December at yeah. the national convention, they had Rock the Row again. All right, and I and I started off at PGRC. I had a few drinks, and I didn't make it any further than Malta, where I ran into Rick, and Rick dragged me up into the archives, and I didn't want to leave. I mean, I'm standing there looking at programs from the yeah. 1956 Olympic trials, and I'm seeing guys yeah. that were ancient when I was a kid rowing and I'm thinking, yeah. I never knew that guy even rode, yeah. but they were in the archives. Yeah, it's fascinating stuff. It, it really is. Um, yeah. I want to go, is, is Liesl still with us? Liesl, uh, we lost her. And, uh, Liesl, I just want to introduce Liesl. She, she was, she's a long-term, long-time member of uh, PGRC, the Girls Rowing Club. She was a U.S. team member in 85, 86, won the head of the Charles several times and and, and she's transitioned into coaching young women. Um, you know, at PGRC, they didn't have the issues that Karen Thompson mentioned with guys on the balcony with guns, uh, but <laughs> they had their own challenges. And, and, and Liesl, I know you wanted to tell us a little bit about your experiences at the head of the school school as a coach and, and also as a competitor. I can tell you, growing at the head of the Schuylkill was that was my first race ever. I raced in a double in '79, and then um, I went on in I think it was in '82. I won um, the head of the Schuylkill in a single for the first time, and I have one of the original uh, uh, Eakins medals. Awesome. It's one of my cherished uh, um, medals. But I think starting second sometimes is better because you have somebody really fast in front of you um, to, to chase. Um, usually the um, championship women's single used to be uh, right after the boys' um, singles. Mm -hmm. And so you would try and catch them. And, um, you know, so if you pass the first person, you know you're flying and then, you know, you can keep on going. Now, when you start first, uh, you have to, you know, kind of push yourself further uh, and try and judge, you know, how fast is that second person behind you? And who knows who's behind that? Sure. So I, I think starting second for me was always a better choice. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious. One of the things Constant, uh, Karen Constance said at the beginning of the evening was, you know, young women today don't realize what people in Karen's generation went through to, to get equity on, on in rowing. Um, do you, do you think young women at the schools you coached had any idea of the history and what folks like Karen went through to become uh, competitors? Well, I made sure that they knew. Uh, when you row at the girls' club, if you ever and, – and, Jim, you, you were just there uh, at last year's convention. Um, the walls are covered with women's rowing history. Um, it's covered with the, the cheesecake shots um, from the newspapers where, mm -hmm. uh, you know – they look like glamour girls, uh, but then it transitions into some really serious rowers, uh, mm -hmm. people um, that have rowed at, at either the junior or senior level of national team um, and the Olympics. Um, it's, it's, it's like really pretty exciting. You can right. see the whole transition. So I make sure that they get to look at all of the, the, um, the stories there. Uh, but one of the things that we have that a lot of women do not have is we every boat in our boathouse is built for a woman. So we don't have to um, worry about, uh, you know, it, who's going to take this boat out from us. 
uh, right. which I know that Karen had to, to deal with that. I actually raised with Karen um, a, a while ago, and it was really right. fun. She's an incredible racer. Yeah. Um, just a really fun person to be around when you're racing, if you're right. in the same boat. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. She's fierce, a fierce competitor. Um, I just wanted to, um, we can we can go on for a little longer. We're getting close to our hour, but I wanted to go back to Jen Wesson, uh, who's uh, going to just tell us how the head of the school is going to continue these uh, virtual happy hours over the course of the next year, Jen. You're mute. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Pete. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to add that what we'd like to do is um, hold kind of monthly or host monthly Zoom meetings where everybody can really see one another and, and interact. Um, and so the HOSR hosts these, we'll advertise them on our social media and our, on our website uh, where people can kind of join in a Zoom call and just kind of catch up and chat and reconnect with one another um, throughout throughout the year. And whether it's old stories, new stories, I mean, I think we can talk about our history and um, and, you know, and and use it in, in the changes that we're going to see going forward um, in, in the years to come. Um, but I think there's so much interest in, in these stories. And I think it's just super important for us to tell them um, as, as insignificant as we may think that they are, uh, they are not. And um, it's part of the culture that, that really makes um, Boathouse Row unique, but also rowing unique. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, the, the more we can draw people in and, and, and show that it's, that it's very, you know, it's a very inclusive process that, you know, we could, um, you know, grow the sport. Yeah. And I think, Jen, you know, you, what you said about it not being insignificant, I think most of the people on this call, rowing is one of the dr motivating and driving forces in our lives. Mm -hmm. and, you know, our relationships revolve around rowing. Some of our family members are rowers. Our best friends are rowers. And uh, it's it's played a huge part in all our lives. So it's it's great to, to get together and chat. I didn't know, Jen, you were a, a Rutgers grad until yesterday when somebody told me, which which I went to, too. So I'm anxious to hear about your time on the Burton River. Yeah. So it's really fun. Yeah, I think we I think we hear all the time that you know people, uh, you know, what are the reasons why we row, and um, it's not it's not we, and I think that this period of time is so difficult for folks because we are we're not able to row, um, because we don't we don't row because times are good. We row to get through the bad times too. So um, you know, it's been difficult. I think not being able to be on the water because it's a it's an outlet for a lot of folks. Um, so it was really important to us this year do something and to um, try to re-engage and reconnect the community well, you know when it needs it most so uh, we can continue this and um, you know if if you um, if people miss tonight these uh, this will be recorded and placed on our YouTube channel as well uh, so people can check back into it and um, we'll, we'll place um, some information on our website about how we'll how we'll continue these conversations um, and and the resources like Rick um, and others along Boathouse Row that are that are really um, making true efforts to archive things. I think uh, Alex, just a few weeks ago, you wrote me an email saying that someone had passed away and they had a basement full of of rowing paraphernalia um, that yeah. the family didn't know what to do with. Um, yeah, so I'm sitting here in my living room, 150 rowing prints from all over the world, and. My dog also passed away yesterday too. Oh, <laughs> Alex! I'm sorry well, to hear that. Alex, make make sure that you know don't throw any of those things away because it's important to find a home for them. And yeah, I think, no, I'll, I'll, uh, that's a good. I was glad to hear you and Jim uh, talking about that, and Dottie too. I, I'd like to uh, show them to you guys, and uh, you know that, that definitely would be a great addition to any. Any rowing uh, home in Philadelphia. Yeah, when I when I had Jim up there in the archives room and I was showing him programs from when he and I were racing together many years ago and when he was racing in the Olympic trials and things like that, those things are so important to, to, to save. And yeah. um, you know, before they, and then we had we had information from the 1936 Olympic trials. 
which was so fascinating. Um, and I don't have time to talk about it now, but I, I discovered some things I never knew about, you know, in the 36 Olympics, which was a, you know, a very important time in our history. So, you know. Alex, you know, uh, what resonated with me tonight is, is what you're doing with the international crews. And I don't know if the Irish that, that you were talking about were the tribesmen from Galway, but I would host them when they were up at the head of the Charles. And the way these people from around the world reciprocate, I mean, they brought my whole team to Galway where we rode in the, the head of the Corrib, which is the last head race in Europe, always raced down in Galway. You know, it is just a tremendous experience for the women on my team to be able to go and learn the history and learn that, you know, the rowing on our little lakes and rivers in the United States, it's compounded by rowing all over the world where everybody feels about their sport as we feel about our sport, you know, and, and that, that brings the world together. It makes it a, a, make it a smaller place. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and and the, those guys from Galway and, and Belfast, we had some there that they really know how to put the beer down. Oh, they certainly do. <laughs> yeah, well, that we, we, we had the Czechoslovakian eight last, the last head of the Schuylkill last year came and we sponsored them to row out of our boathouse. And they did quickly discover our bar. Um, and and um, they were great guys, though. And we made some great contacts. And, did very well in the regatta too, so they were happy because they'd rode the head of the Charles the week before, and then come down here and rode the head of the Schuylkill, and they went back happy. So I echo what Jim says: it's so important to establish those relationships with these people overseas. Great. I mean, we can continue for a few more minutes if anybody else has anything else they'd like to add. Certainly. Well, you know, there's we're gonna we're gonna learn halfway through your presentation. Um, I don't know if you want to add a few more uh, words, Chris Christopher Blackwell. Oh, what happened? Because I got frozen. You did. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you did. We got halfway through your. Uh, we 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 didn't get to, to the grit part yet. Oh, really? The grit part. Well, the grit part was uh, was this fellow uh, Bill Bill Wright, who grew up in East Falls had severe cerebral palsy and I was coaching a couple of days a week uh, out of number four. I had a big row cat, uh, ugly, ugly looking thing, but very stable, a double. And I would row people up to Gerard Bridge and back and then take on, take on another customer, etc. So my last customer one particular evening was Bill Wright. Bill was probably in his 50s severely impacted by cerebral palsy, uh, but just a great guy. So we, we, we go out and we row up to Girard and we turn around at Girard and I start rowing back and I shipped my oars without telling him. And when we got to the, to the, to the Viking, I said, Bill, I've got to tell you something. You just rowed us all the way back from Girard on your own. I haven't rowed. <laughs> I said, yeah, he was just absolutely flabbergasted because when he was growing up as a boy, he looked at the singles on the river and the other boats and said to himself, oh, I wish I could do that. So he was one person who, through his personal grit, became, became involved. Anyway, that night I decided it was, it was, he was the last customer and I had some help and put the boat away. And then I thought, I'll walk with you, Jim, uh, uh, Bill. I just wanted to see, or just I wanted to chat with him some more. So we're walking and chatting. And I found out, and here, here he was, had trouble walking, dragging his feet, um, and just staggering his way back to the car. And it was a quarter mile away. And I thought to myself, oh my God, this guy is unbelievable. The grit and courage it takes to even be around in society when you're severely impacted like that is big enough. The grit and courage it took him to, to, to come down to the boathouse, just to get to the boathouse, mm -hmm. was amazing. Now, he and his wife, Nancy, lived independently in East Falls for, for a number of years. 
And during that time, they were burglarized more than once and beaten up. Eventually, they became permanent residents at Ingle, Ingle's house, which was a happy place for them to land. Yeah. And we both passed on by, by now, but they were both wonderful people, wonderful people. Yeah, I, th I think all of us who have are privileged to, to be really healthy, um, we, take, we take our health for granted sometimes. So I think uh, it sounds like a really uh, inspirational guy. Thanks, Chris. So I think, um, Jen, we're going to turn it back to you to wrap up. And um, this, this yeah, yeah. thank you, everybody. I think our producer was going to throw a, a picture up for us um, that is reminiscent of, of something, Pete, you brought up, the HOSR culture. Um, yeah, we <laughs> <laughs> but when we when we started uh, when the committee started talking and we started talking about who we're going to honor, uh, we really got into this idea of of the things that stand out to people about the head of the Schuylkill. And I can remember back in way back in the college days, hearing about these amazing Halloween parties. Uh, and and Pete, you were there from the very beginning. Well, maybe not from the beginning. I think Jimmy Dietz was at. The some of the boathouse parties before I did were pe people people flew downstairs and things like that. But the point is we had a lot of fun. Um, usually nobody got hurt and, uh, uh, and we rode hard. So it was, all, it was all good. And it's, it's all part of the great memories that uh, everyone had. Yeah. Hey, Jim, you want to tell us, you want to tell us a little bit about uh, the accommodations at Vesper boat club during that period in the third floor. Oh, it was it was a zoo. <laughs> we had, we had a lot of good people up there. I started off living there. Dietrich uh, got me to come down, and he was putting together a training group. We had uh, John Hardigan and Al Flanders were the original two guys, and then Calvin Coffey, Tony Heidoffer, uh, Casey Baker. I mean, people, it was a revolving door of, of people coming in and it wasn't as fashionable and plush as it is today. I can remember many a night sleeping on the roof, you know, uh, just, just for the air and, and whatever, but yeah. uh, the memories were fantastic. You know, uh, John Campbell was there at that period as well. We had, we had some really good people and really great times. Yeah. Uh, well, if we had more time, I'd tell you about the big fight at Vesper, but that's for another evening. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jim, we, we had Malta during that period of time because we have adjoining boat clubs, as you know. Yeah, the walls, yeah. Yeah, it was kind of an, we were kind of getting concerned. We were thinking of calling the Board of Health a couple of times <laughs> because we got you had so many people over there on that third floor. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah you guys, right. it was to make it was like twenty dollars a month. You guys at Malta, all you did was complain, complain, complain. complain. <laughs> yeah. All right, so we will continue this, and um, we'll we'll plan something for next month. Um, and I'm going to give you actually a little sneak peek of our next um, uh, story uh, that we're going to honor. Uh, and push out next week. So um, I think our producer is going to throw up a picture. I'm not going to say the name, uh, but this is the story to come um, in, in the following week. And maybe we can make that um, the kickoff to the conversation in our next uh, Zoom call. But we also have more happening tomorrow, right? Absolutely. So in the remainder of our programming this week, um, tomorrow night we have... Um, a love letter Philadelphia, which um, is going to be fantastic programming. Um, Jody will be back with us again, and Pete, um, along with um, many of our uh, city officials um, and folks from the visitor center, um, Catherine Not Lovell, our commissioner of Parks and Rec. So it should be a really great time, and we're going to talk about the history of the Schuylkill um, and the history of the city and why. Um, uh, the city is so important to the history of American rowing um, and how that kind of evolved into a training place for um, high performance teams and how people have come here to train and um, ended up calling it home. So we'll have some folks uh, that'll talk um, about how they came here and, and, uh, and, and came here to stay. Um, so I want to thank everyone for participating tonight. This was really great, really great to see everybody's faces. 
Um, we appreciate the time that you spent with us. And uh, we will see you tomorrow night and uh, nights in the future. Thank you. Thank you.